I don't know about you, but boy, when you just sing those, it just sense, you can just sense the Spirit of God. I, it's just amazing I mean, how the Holy Spirit just empowers that and speaks through it and uses it and anoints it and says things to our heart. And as we sing it, we're encouraged not only to sing the words, but to believe those words because those words are words from God's Word about how the Spirit of God works in us and what the Spirit of God does to us, through us, and for us, and we're encouraged by, by, by Jesus himself and the Spirit of God and God the Father to believe every bit of that, that it's true in our life, it's true about our life, it's true for our life, and that's what God does in us when we're attached to the vine, according to John 15. All of the fruit of the Spirit... Um, I've conveyed to you, and we're now in our third message in the Fruit of the Spirit series. The first fruit we looked at was love, which is, I think, the basis of all of these gifts, because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, and I don't have love, I love I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I'm just noise in the house. And though I, though I give all, sell all of my possessions so that I can give it, the money to the poor and though I would have my body burned at the stake so I, could, so I could blaze for the glory of God and I have not love, it profits me nothing. And then in the last verse it said, and now we have faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love, so I believe the fruit of love is the basis for all of the gifts of the Spirit. And so it's listed first, and we've looked at it and talked about how the fruit of love is a major part of what the Holy Spirit ministers into our life. The second fruit we looked at last week, which is the fruit of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I mean, you can't frown and say that, you know. Whenever you say the joy of the Lord, I mean, it's just automatically a, a smile on your face because it is that joy that takes us through these unbelievably difficult times that we face, believing that God is going to do everything to walk with us and, 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 and motivate us and, and, and strengthen us so that with his joy, we can walk through those things that are so horrible in life. And then he comes to the third of the fruit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and it's the fruit of peace. And the fruit of peace is a tremendous truth in our life, a tremendous blessing in our life. One of the, one of the most beautiful names given to our Father in heaven is what uh, Romans chapter 16, where Paul says, let me, let me give you this. The first kind of peace that he gives is upward peace, and I know that you guys that have the outline, just go ahead and put that down. There are three aspects we're going to talk about peace, and the first one is this upward peace, peace with God. Whenever, whenever the Lord comes into our life, what does he bring? He brings peace. So the first type of peace that the Bible wants to talk about as fruit of the Spirit is a, an upward peace, and that upward peace is that we have peace with God. And as I mentioned, the first uh, in Roman in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul uh, gives God the Father a tremendous, beautiful name, and he calls him and the God of peace will crush Satan under his feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This was said, by the way, when the when. In the church at Rome, there were some divisive things that were going on, and people were being divisive in the church. And so the Lord says to them through the Spirit and the Apostle Paul's writing, look, you guys that are being divisive, you guys that are stirring up stuff in the church, I just want you to know that I'm the God of peace, and the God of peace is going to take over. And if you're working against the peace of God in the body of Christ, uh, I'm, I'm going to deal with Satan. I'm going to crush him because I am the God of peace. Tremendous name for God the Father. And then 700 years before Jesus came on this earth and before Jesus was born, Isaiah the prophet 
gave a tremendous prophecy concerning Jesus and his birth and his reign on this earth. And in chapter 9, verse 2, uh, Isaiah said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. I love that. I love the description of that. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. And then verse, nine, verse 6, he says, For unto them a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So God's name is called the God of Peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And in Romans, the first verse of Romans 5, we get the gospel in one verse, and the apostle says, therefore, having been justified by faith, everybody look at your neighbor and say, have you been justified? You know what justified means, right? Justified means that God has come into my life and has done something to me to make it where where I have, just as if I'd never, never sinned. When God saves our soul, what he does is he justifies us. He, he washes us clean, and it is just as if I'd never sinned in my life. So uh, Paul says in Romans 5, 1, therefore having been justified by faith, notice we don't get justified by what we do about how we act and things we perform. Ephesians 2, by the way, says that it is by faith that we are saved through grace, and that not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we need peace with God? It's because until you receive Christ by faith, you, you, are, you don't have peace with God. The reason we need to make peace with God is because we're estranged from God. It's because from the time you're conceived until the time you die, you have, been, you, you have been at odds with God because you've been given tainted blood, <laughs> the blood that is passed down the lineage. You know, we were singing today about the precious blood of the Lamb, about the crimson flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that washes our old, dingy, dirty, grimy, sin-filled blood. It started with Adam and Eve when they rebelled against God in the garden. You remember that when, when they were created, they were created to walk in the presence of God, to be in the presence of God. And they decided that they would disobey God and eat of the tree that God said, you can have of all the other trees in the garden except that one right there. And don't eat of that one because the day that you eat of that one is the day that you will begin to die. You will surely die and of course, you remember what happened. They ate of that one. And when they ate of that one, when God came into their presence in the garden where before they were not clothed, they were naked, but they were not ashamed, I propose to you that the reason that they could be naked and not be ashamed is because they were clothed. What were they clothed with? They were clothed with the glory of God. And when, he, and when man sinned, they fell all the way from glory to leaves. They had to cover themselves up for they realized they were naked and they sewed leaves together, fig leaves together, and covered themselves because now they were ashamed. And there was no glory of God that inhabited the earth at that time. Now there was still glory, the Shekinah glory, in a cloud of glory that hovered over the nation of Israel. There was, there was the glory of God that, that was held in the Ark of the Covenant as it traveled across the desert, but there was no visible, tangible evidence of the glory of God falling in anybody's life because man had lost the glory of God. Man had sinned and lost the glory of God. That's why the book of Romans says, in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, 
No, not one. In verse 23 of that same chapter, Romans 3, it said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is sin? Sin is to come short of the glory of God. Now, when Jesus was on this earth, a, a, an unusual thing happened. The unusual thing is that when he was in Jericho one day, he was walking down the street with a whole big crowd behind him. And there was this little short guy that was out, wanted to see Jesus. His name was Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus said, I can't see over the crowd. I want to see Jesus. And so Zacchaeus went and climbed up in a sycamore tree, ran out on a branch that was over the streets where Jesus walked by. And when Jesus, walking by, got to the place where Zacchaeus was, the Bible says he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, which shows you it was a word from the Lord to Jesus. Look up, Jesus. And he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going to go home with you today. And I'm going to have supper with you and fellowship with you. And Zacchaeus scurried down a tree. Zacchaeus was a rich tax collector. And he went home and he invited all of his old rich, heathen, reprobate tax collector buddies to come and be at the house when Jesus got there. And when Jesus got there, all of those tax collectors, all of those sinners, all of those reprobates were out there ready to have supper with Jesus. And Jesus sits down and has supper with all those sinners. And everybody began to criticize Jesus and say, Jesus, what are you doing hanging around sinners? What are you doing? You, do you know what you're doing? I mean, why did you come to earth anyway? And then Jesus made this statement in Luke 19. He said, for the son of man. He said, he said look, I didn't come for well people. I didn't come for people who think they don't need a physician. I came for these people right here who know that they're dying and they're dead in their sins and dead in their trespasses and they need me to have life. And he said, and these are the words he spoke, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What is that? That to seek and to save that which is lost. That which is lost is the glory of God. What did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to restore to lost, fallen man the glory of God. And the glory of God, after thousands of years now, returns to this earth in the presence of, the, of salvation being washed by the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus brings it. Because you remember when Jesus was born, the Bible says that out on the plains of Bethlehem, there was a group of temple shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord appeared unto them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord came and said to them, Fear not! For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then there was suddenly a, a multitude of heavenly, heavenly beings saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward all men. And the Prince of Peace was born on this earth to reestablish the glory of God that was lost. Why do we need to make peace with God? Because without Christ, we don't have peace with God. Without Christ, we are alienated from God. Without Christ, we are separated from God. Without Christ, we are the enemy of God. This is what, this is what, uh, uh, this is what, uh, you could really look. This is a bumper sticker. You've seen it before. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. That's a cute little clever play on words, but it's biblically accurate. If you know Jesus Christ, you will know peace. If you don't know Jesus Christ, then you are not going to know peace. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Now remember... He's just a few hours away from being taken by soldiers 
and beaten with a cat of nine tails and stripped of his garments and stripped of his clothing. His body's going to be mutilated beyond the, the ability to look at him as a man. He's going to be cut to ribbons and shreds by a cat of nine tails. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be embarrassed going through the streets of Jerusalem with a heavy cross that becomes so heavy that he, it, he, 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 just, it, he just falls and he can't carry the, the burden. And, and Simon of Serene has to be petitioned, come help him get the cross up there where he belongs. And, it, and, he, and he goes, and, I mean, all of this horrible, horrible stuff that's about to happen to him. And Jesus, on the very night, knowing what was going to happen to him, looked at his disciples and said, guys, I want you to know about something. I want you to know about the greatest thing that's about to happen. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you a peace that is different from the world's peace. It's not the kind of peace that you can get from the world. It's my peace. Notice what he said in 1427. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Right. Let, your heart, let not your heart be troubled and neither let it be afraid. Yes. Yes. Once I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I am now abiding on the vine, which John 4, 15 says that if, if I abide in him and he abides in me, that I'm going to be attached to the vine and I'll be able to perform all of the fruit bearing of God for I, he is the vine and I am the branch and without him, I can do nothing. And so when I get attached to the vine, I make peace with God and Jesus gives me a peace that the world can't give me. Now the world can give you some peace or else Jesus wouldn't say that it could. Jesus said, I'm gonna give you my peace that's different from the world's peace, implying that the world does have a peace. That the world can give you a peace. Riches can give you a peaceful life. You know, popularity can give you an exalted life. Pleasure can give you an exalted season in life. So what is the difference between God's peace and the world's peace? Well, the world's peace is phony peace. The world's peace is fake peace. The world's peace fizzles before it gets finished. Because the world wants to legislate peace. The world wants to create laws that will create peace among men and goodwill on this earth. But you and I know that no matter how many laws you pass, you are not able to legislate peace on this earth. And you can herd people together with all kind of zonings and busings and covenants and all kind of manners of rules and regulations and putting together of all kinds of communities based on law. But you and I know that the only way that black people and white people and red people and yellow people and purple people and green people and bronze people and black people and no long hair people and short hair people and no hair people uh, <laughs> and, and Jew and Arab and sinner and saint. The only way we will ever come together is that we are changed on the inside and our heart is changed by what? The Prince of Peace. Yeah, yeah. Now this is upward peace. No longer are we estranged from God. No longer are we separated from God. No longer are we an enemy of God because we have made peace with God peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the way God creates peace. I just told you the world does it by creating rules, laws, whatever, to try to push us together and make us be together and make us love each other. Here's what God said he does. This is in Ephesians 2. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. Uh-oh, I'm seeing something here. And has broken down the middle wall of separation. 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. The way the world, the way the world tries to create peace is to push us together, to force us together, to give laws that will bind us and make us live at peace with each other, which will never happen until the Prince of Peace comes on the inside of us and changes both of us in our heart by the Prince of Peace. And God said he does this by coming into your heart and my heart and changing both of our hearts so that now we're not that man and this man. We are one man and our hearts are put together because God has broken down the dividing wall between us and we are now not two separate persons, but we are one purpose with one goal, one life, one Savior, and we have the Prince of Peace living in our life, and we can have true joy and true peace because our life is now controlled by the Prince of Peace. And so God works in our life to restore the salvation that restores the glory of God. I found a little story that was interesting. I'm going to read it to you. Take just a second. When John was an 11-year-old boy, his father trained him in the art of being a master captain of a trade ship. When the British Navy drafted him, he could, could have done well as the captain of a Royal Navy ship, but he lacked self-discipline. And he got in with the wrong crew. John was arrested for desertion. And he was publicly flogged and demoted to common sailor. At 21, John hopped on board an outbound ship from the African coast and continued in the depravity of his teens, getting involved with the lowest of crew members. He would ridicule the sailors in his company. He would ridicule the ship's captain and even ridiculed a book that he found on board entitled The Imitation of Christ. One night, the ship sailed into a violent storm and John awakened with his cabin filled with seawater. The ship's side had caved in and ordinarily such damage would send the ship to the bottom within a few minutes. The buoyant cargo, however, bought a few hours of precious time and after nine hours at the pumps, John overheard a desperate remark from one of the crew members, we're all goners. For the first time in his life, John prayed and said, God, if this will not do, have mercy on us. And miraculously, the ship did not go down. Did John forget his prayer? No, it's remembered with prayer and fasting every year on its anniversary as the most significant incident in his life. And John Newton retired from the sea to become a minister who wrote the words to this popular hymn we sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. John Newton found that night at sea the upward peace with God. The second aspect of peace that God works in our life when we're attached to the vine, I'm going to call inward peace. The peace of God. Once I make peace with God, then I'm eligible for the peace of God. The peace of God is that peace that comes to you in the middle of all those dark things that happen in your life, all those terrible circumstances that happen in your life. In the book of Philippians, which you know should be subtitled the joy book, right? Paul writes while he's in a Roman prison cell to a church that, that, that he's not even in, the, book, the church at Philippi. And he's writing from a prison cell in a dungeon in Rome back to a church and telling them how to be joyful in the midst of everything. And he writes in chapter 4, and he starts telling them, look, there's something going on in the church at Philippi, and I know it is, and he starts giving them instructions. And then in verse 6, 
He tells them, be anxious for nothing. The old King James word that is there for anxious is the word careful. If you've read that in the old original King James Version, it say, be careful for nothing. Which every time I read that, I think, be full of care for no thing. <laughs> yeah. My life is not to be full of care for anything in life. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now, have you ever thought of peace as a guard? You've probably thought of peace as a trust. You've probably thought of peace as a security. You may even have thought of peace as a comfort in your life. But have you ever thought of peace as a guard? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Most of us here know our dear sweet brother who now is in California with his daughters because he's gotten to the age where somebody needs to help him a lot. Brother Charles, Charles Lucas usually sat right there, 80-something years old. I always picked at him. I always said he was 85, but I think he's only 82. And, but he was surprised could be C.C. Love. He was joyous. He was happy. Man, I mean, you know, he went through a lot of things. He was the best-dressed man in Gulfport. He was always stylish and always dapper and always bright and always cheery. Brother Charles was in this church from the time this church started. That's right, that's right. Brother Charles was in this church almost 12 years. Yeah. And all that time, and even years before, I think for a... For a total of over 20 years, I, I don't know if you knew this, but Brother Charles was on kidney dialysis because his kidneys failed. He was on dialysis longer than anybody I've ever known in my life. That's the truth. And, and, and when we used to have Bible classes in businesses like uh, in Gulfport, we had a, a Bible class in a, in a business, and in Biloxi, we had a Bible class in a business. And Brother Charles used to ride a scooter that I nicknamed Lightning. Yeah. And, and it got, got a little dangerous because people would run over you on a little scooter. I don't know if you know that or not. And so he sold Lightning, and that meant uh, somebody had to go pick him up and, and bring him. And, I, and it was me a lot of times. And so I went by, and I would pick him up, and we'd be on our way to the Bible class, and I would be talking to him about things. And, and you know, it, it just became apparent that in spite of the fact that he went to dialysis three times a week, and that when he came out, he was weak and he was, you know, it just drained him and all that kind of stuff. And he just kept, like the Energizer Bunny, he just kept going and going and going and going and going. And I looked at him and I said, Brother Charles, how do you do this? I mean, you go to dialysis and you can't even, you can barely walk. And yet you come to Bible class all the time. You, you, come, you, you come to church all the time. You one of the happiest, friendliest, nicest, upbeat, smiling, friendly persons I know. How do you do it? And he said, well, pastor, I just have a belief that God's going to take care of me. Yeah, yeah. And God's going to see me through. Now, this is the kind of peace that the Bible is talking about as a kind of peace that guards your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. What does it guard you against? Well, it guards you against storms. Storms, storm, what kind of storms? Storms of disappointment. Storms of doubt. Storms of misinterpreting the purpose of God. I look over our congregation every Sunday and I, I, I pray for you. Because I can see, I, and I know some of your stories, and some of you have, have lost children in birth or shortly after birth. I know some of you have lost husbands and 
Others of you have lost wives. I know many of you have lost your health to some of the most unique, strange diseases and sicknesses in life. I look at you at times and there are tears rolling down your face because of all the ills and the frailties and the weaknesses and the attacks that the enemy brings against you and accuses you. And walk. I look into the eyes of parents that are confused and frustrated because of their children and they can't understand. Why do they act this way? Why are they this way? Why can't I do anything to change their life? And when God protects your heart with peace in spite of all of that stuff, that is the peace of God. And that peace of God passes all understanding. You can't understand it. The world can't understand it. Nobody can comprehend it. Nobody can get, how can you be at peace when all of this has crushed down on your life? The peace of God has guarded your heart so that the enemy can't kill you with disappointment, with doubt, with fear, with hatred with misinterpretation like he wants to do. The peace of God has become a guard that guards your life. And do you have to understand it in order to have it? No, you don't. Because I submit, not only does the world not understand it, you don't understand it either. And neither do I. Many of you know our daughter, Amy. And let's just put it this way, Amy's kind of stubborn. Amy, Amy's pretty independent. I think the, the nice uh, psychological word nowadays is, uh, is uh, what? Um, strong, uh, strong-willed, strong-willed. That's that nice psychological word. She's strong-willed. Well, when she and Justin, Justin was about eight, Amy's about six, and we were passing a church in Meridian, and in front of the education building of that church, there was a long porch that was concrete, and it was covered, and it was real kind of smooth and nice. Well, one day, Justin and I were out there uh, fooling with, some, with a skateboard. Now, this tells you how long ago it was. Uh, fooling with a skateboard. And we were doing pretty good on a skateboard, you know, all things considered. And Amy sees us, and here comes Amy. She wants to get on the skateboard. And so I said, okay, baby, okay. You get on the skateboard, and I'm going to hold on to you and I, so that you don't fall off and hurt yourself while we're trying, you know, you're going to find the skateboard to be a little different than you think. And so, of course, that wouldn't do. Uh, and she had another uh, suggestion, like always. And her suggestion is, no, Daddy, let me hold on to you. And I said, well, okay, learn a lesson, baby. Grab on. And she grabbed on to me, and I started walking, and she's holding on to me. And after about five or six feet, out goes the skateboard, down goes Amy. And she she hit on her knee like this, and she got up and she was rubbing that knee, and she looked at me, and I said, well, baby, are you all right? Yeah. She said, but but this time, Daddy, uh, you you hold on to me. (laughs) You hold on to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, So that's what the Holy Spirit does with the peace of God. The Holy Spirit gives us the peace of God where I don't have to be anxious about anything because all of the things that come against me in life doesn't depend upon me holding on to God, but is the assurance that it is God who is holding my hand And he'll never let go and he'll never let loose and he carries me. I don't hang on to him. One of the great great hymns of faith that we sing was written by a man who was a successful attorney in Chicago. The father of five children, an active member of a Presbyterian church, his successful life suddenly turned to disaster when without warning, His only son died. Then in the Chicago fire, he lost all of his real estate investments. He decided to take his family to Europe to lift their spirits and assist Dwight Moody in an evangelistic campaign. 
He sent his wife and his four daughters ahead by ship. Halfway across the Atlantic, their ship was struck by an English ship and sank in 12 minutes. Tanetta, Maggie, Annie, and Bessie, his four daughters, drowned in a watery grave. Miraculously, Mrs. Spafford was saved when Horatio was standing on the ship carrying him to rejoin his sorrowing wife in Wales. The ship passed the approximate place where his precious daughters had drowned. Overwhelmed in his grief, he took out a legal pad and wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That is the peace of God that passes all understanding. That is the peace of God that guards our mind against the attacks of the enemy. And listen, you can only have the peace of God when you make peace with God. Because only God can give it to sustain us to keep us safe in the storms of life. So there is the upward peace, the peace with God. There is the inward peace, the peace of God. One more aspect of peace on the vine, there is the outward peace, peace with one another. Because we're in Christ, because we're attached to the vine, we enjoy peace. If we're at peace with God, then we can truly experience the peace of God. And because we experience the peace of God, we can have real peace with others. I submit to you that peace without the Prince of Peace and the God of Peace is impossible. Not highly unlikely it is possible for you to have true peace with another person, if you both aren't affected by the Prince of Peace. Look at Colossians 3, verse 15. This is Apostle Paul speaking. And he said, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Notice first the second word there, and let. What does let imply? And let. If I said, let, 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 let this happen in your life what would I be saying to you? I'd be saying, you have a choice. Right. If you're going to let it happen, it means you also have a choice to not let it happen. So the Holy Spirit says, you must allow this to happen in your life. Allow what? You, you allow the peace of God to rule in your hearts. The word rule comes from the Greek word brabeus, which means literally to act as umpire. So this verse is saying, allow, let, encourage, open the door, invite him in, let the peace of God act as an umpire in your life. So what does an umpire do besides make all the fans mad? Well, the umpire keeps peace. The umpire makes sure that the game is played in a smooth and orderly manner. The fruit of peace is God's internal umpire who will keep peace even where there is, there is, in, there is uh, destruction and, and, and crudeness in everybody and everything and everything in life is going to pieces. So we're encouraged to let the peace of God become the umpire in our life for all situations. And then in Romans 12, Paul says, I want you to know that relationally, in relationships, you are going to have the choice of allowing the peace of God to make a difference in your relationships. He says it in Romans 12, if it is possible as much as in you is, live peaceably with all men. Implying that it's not always in you, 
But as much as in you is, as much as you can do it, you don't shut the door on your sign. You unlock the door and you leave uh, the door open for reconciliation or, or at least for a restoration of the relationship. You know, sometimes you're not able to reconcile, which just means uh, get everything worked out because you have two different points of views, two different desires, blah, 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 blah. But you can heal the relationship. The relationship is I love you. Reconciliation means I love what you do. So you may never get it reconciled, but you can restore the relationship because of the peace of God and you are not to shut the door on your side. Now, I submit to you that a non-Christian can no more produce the peace of God in their relationships than a man in the moon. It just won't happen because uh, they come from two different roots. But once the Prince of Peace creates a common root in your life through Jesus Christ, once that common root in Jesus is there, then we become children of peace and we can get along with each other because of the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace. Let me read you a couple of verses in Philippians 4 that come before verses 6 and 7 where it says, and the peace of God. Here's verses 2 and 3. Remember, the Apostle Paul's writing from a prison cell in Rome, not from the Holiday Inn in Philippi. But notice what he says. I beseech, or I implore you, Odia, which is a woman in the church. And I implore Seneca, which is another woman in the church, to be of the same mind in the Lord. What's going on there? Well, you have two women in the church that are fighting over something. They're not of the same mind. They're not in accord with each other. And even though we're never told what it is they're fighting over, we are told that whatever it is that they were fighting over, it was bad enough that the news of the fight went from Philippi to a prison cell in Rome, and Paul heard about it in the prison cell at Rome, which just tells you when Christians get to fighting about something, everybody hears about it. How many times have you or I, I don't know if you've talked to people about coming to church or coming to the Lord and have them say to you, man, uh, pastor, I, I know that you, you're nice and everything and, and you mean good, but I'm not ever going to come to church. You know why? Because they're always fighting about something down there. What a bad testimony. The apostle Paul airs the dirty laundry of the church by saying, man, if, if there's anything that will win the world to Christ, it would be that these people love each other and the unity of the church draws people to the church. I submit to you that the reason many of you are here is because we don't fuss and fight over a bunch of stuff. And you feel like, man, this is my church and they love me and I love it and it's a wonderful place to be because they all believe the same thing. They all honor the same thing. They all love each other in spite of their differences. Man, we're from everywhere. All kind of states, all kind of cultures, all kind of races, all kind of e everything. If these people that are watching online could look and see everybody in here, they would see one of the most diverse situations that you've ever seen in your life. How does that happen? The unity of God testifies to the world that the peace of God yeah, yeah. reigns in this place, whereby disunity, bickering and fighting, runs people away from the church and becomes a testimony that destroys rather than strengthens this church. And that bad news and disunity travels everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. We talked about it Wednesday night at prayer meeting. I believe it was Dale that asked the question, said, Pastor, uh, you know, all this bad stuff that happens with Christians and these, these preachers. I mean, every time a preacher gets messed up, uh, they put on national news. The bigger he is, the better they like it. And, and they show all the sins and all the different things all over the world so that, Unsaved people and non-Christians can look at it and say, "Look, I told you so. Look at that. 
They're just a bunch of hypocrites. Look at them. That's the best leader. That's one of their guys supposed to be spiritual. That's one of the guys that he saved and knows Christ. And look at that. I told you it was a joke. And Satan just roars. Do you know that the Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion who roams to and fro on this earth seeking whom he may devour? What is that? Does a lion, when does a lion roar? When he's, when he's stalking his prey? I mean, when he's sneaking up on his prey and he gets about right here and goes, Rah! and his prey goes, Pew! no, 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 no. The lion sneaks up on his prey and jumps him and destroys him and then stands with his feet on him roaring, Rah! look what I did. This is mine. Rah! And Satan roars all over the world. And every time the church fusses and fights and bickers and quarrels and fails and falls and the peace of God doesn't reign, the devil makes sure everybody hears that. And there's a terribly bad testimony. Jesus came to be the prince of peace. The prince of peace. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Not Prince of Long Suffering, not Prince of Gentleness, not Prince of Goodness, not Prince of Meekness, not, not even get Prince of, uh, 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 of, of, of Self Discipline, but Prince of Peace. What does Prince of Peace imply? It implies a relational peace. Peace is relational between two opposing views and odds. Jesus is the Prince of Peace because he came to heal relationships in life that we can be in unity with each other. What happens with the, with the fruit of peace? It creates an upward peace, peace with God, an inward peace, the peace of God, and an outward peace, a relational peace, peace with one another. I don't know how many of you saw the, it's a classic story. I don't, I, I'm not sure if you've ever even heard of it before. It was a movie from the 50s. And it went back when Peter Sellers, you know, the Pink Panther Peter Sellers, was just real young. And this was maybe probably one of his first movies. It was called The Mouse That Roared. And the mouse that roared was about a little tiny country called the Duchy of Grand Fenwick. And the Duchy of Grand Fenwick was about a thousand people, little tiny spot country. And they were having all kinds of problems in the country. They were going bankrupt. Their infrastructure was just going to pieces and everything like that. And they came across the idea that that every, every nation that ever has a war with the United States of America, once the war is over, the United States goes into that country they defeated and rebuilds the country and brings tons of money into it and props it back up and builds it back up better than it was before they had to fight with the United States. And so this tiny little duchy of Grand Fenwick, a thousand people, get their army together. They fight with Eve Steele with crossbows and mail on and send them over to the U.S. And they attack the U.S. <laughs> and declare war on the U.S. And of course, it takes about a day or two. I mean, really, to even find out, hey, this country's at war with us. And it takes about a day or two to whip them. And sure enough, the United States does what it always does. It went into the Grand Duchy of, of Grand Fenwick and rebuilt the country and everybody lived happily ever after as they always do or usually did in the 50s. I, I tell you that little account to ask you this. Why does God want to make peace with you? Because he wants you to surrender so that he can then pour into you that which you so desperately need and can't buy for yourself, can't afford for yourself, love, yeah, yeah. joy, peace, 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. You surrender to Him. He rebuilds you better than you ever were before. And it comes when you surrender and make peace with God. Thank you.